How's it growing? I'm excited about this episode because in it you'll see the presentation that I gave to the Rare Fruit Council of Palm Beach and my topic was feeding the soil or soil building. I use those terms interchangeably. Regardless, my approach is from the organic and permaculture perspective. We're talking healthy soil, healthy plants, healthy people. As you'll see before I dive into the main topic, I showed how awful our yard looked when we bought this house in 2011. It is night and day difference. And if you've seen our house, you may be shocked when you see these photos. If you're one who would rather skip over everything that I talk about leading up to the main topic, you just want to get to the meat of the subject, I'll make that easy for you. I'll add chapter markers. And if you're not familiar with chapters in YouTube videos, click on the chapter time markers that I'll add in the description. Let's get right to it. How's it growing? I'm going to tell you a filthy four letter word and I'm just going to say it, okay? Dirt. Dirt. <laughs> you must have seen my channel. Dirt is dead to me, but soil is full of life, microbes, fungi, all kinds of life. It's a web of life in the soil. We've got a little contest for us tonight, and whoever can answer this question, I've got seeds for these python snake bean with a beautiful exotic flower. You can also buy these on uh, rareseeds.com or Baker Creek, but uh, they, they tend to run out of stock quite a bit on this because it's such a high demand type of thing. Who can name this woman and tell me what she does? Anybody? What was it? Okay, the question is, who can name this woman and tell me what she does? So far, you're the one get, that's giving them the seeds, unless someone can come up with her name. So, yeah, she, you're right. She's a soil scientist. It sounded like a great thing. This is Dr. Elaine Ingham. She's amazing, and I, I get most of my information on this from her. So here's the preview of, of what we're going to go over tonight. So who is David Stack and Stack's Urban Harvest? I'm going to try to go through some of this pretty quickly without getting into, I tend to get on a rabbit trail and then we don't get into the meat of the, of the, the talk. So what I'm growing, what I'm grafting, here's number three is really the meat of what we're here for, it's soil building for better fruit production. Soil biology, bacteria, fungi, compost, mulch, and just something else. What I do for a living is I, for, I have 25 plus years of television and video production. The business of people is one of the most- I got furloughed from my job of 17 years. That's when I bought some equipment and started Stacks Urban Harvest. Dirt is dead to me. There's no life in it. Soil, on the other hand, is full of microbes. And also try to get Stack Studios going, just in case I didn't have a job coming my way, and thankfully it did, and it's just a few miles away from here, even though I live in Fort Lauderdale <laughs> in Oakland Park. But you know what? <laughs> I'll take a long commute. I was asked by someone that I highly, highly regard to do a film, a small documentary. I'll talk about that later. And then we'll do question and answer. What this is not, what I don't want this to be is, because we could get into a discussion of organic versus inorganic gardening. And I don't, that's a whole other topic that's a whole subject in itself. It would take the whole night plus more. And I really don't want to, I just want to share what I'm doing. And when I gave Hal and Sally a, a garden tour, they came over to get some mulch, some extra mulch that I had and gave them a little garden tour. And they were so impressed, they said, you gotta speak at this group. <laughs> so I really appreciate it, thanks for having me. 
I, I feel like there's so much that I could learn from so many of you. And I, what I love about what we, what we do here is we learn from each other. And no matter how long you've been gardening, there's always something else to learn. And every day that I spend in the garden, there's another lesson for me. And it's just, I'm, I'm just so fascinated with nature. One thing about me is I love natural remedies. I mean, I don't get any, any money for any products that I'm endorsing. I'm, I, just, I might bring up something like this oregano oil just because it got me off of my allergy meds completely. Like, completely. I was so reliant on, on uh, several uh, allergy meds. And, you know, I know everyone's a little different and their allergies may be a little different, but once I, this is the, the brand, North American Spice, Herb and Spice, but it's pretty expensive. And I found that even cheaper brands like the Now brand works for me. And uh, whether it's doing it topically on the bottom of my feet or, you know, I didn't even, I didn't believe when I heard, when I heard that you could do that, I didn't believe it until when we went to Costa Rica for my 50th birthday. I didn't bring my diffuser. I didn't. I decided I'm just gonna try the the foot method, and it worked. It completely worked. Anyway, that's another rabbit trail I could spend too much time on. But that's my whole point of that is, if there's a natural remedy that can do something. I'd rather go with the natural natural remedy because guess what? It might have other side health benefits. And so I, I do that applying it to, to soil. I've always loved cats. Loved, love, love, love cats. So I, as the introduction said, I grew up in Southern California on five acres. We had lots of fruit trees. My dad had a kiwi farm, a little kiwi field. And the sad thing about it is that he only had one cash crop after years and years of a lot of, a lot of work. And I just really wish that he knew what I know today about some of the methods that I'm sharing tonight because I know it would have made a huge difference. What high school did you go to? Ramona High School. Rosemont. All right. Yeah, Ramona is my hometown. Not Pomona. People think I say Pomona. It's Ramona. My dad built me a greenhouse. Well, he built a greenhouse and I took it over. <laughs> I really did. I, I couldn't wait to get to get home from high school. Uh, my brother was the oldest. I was the youngest. We had nothing in common. While he was rebuilding engines, and I was potting flowers. And I, I, they talked me into going in, in the track in, in high school, and I had tried it one day, and I quit the first day. I was like, why would I do this when I could be in my greenhouse? <laughs> so I knew I was really different at a very early age. <laughs> Uh, so then I fast forward to when I moved to Florida, and there was a huge learning curve. My goodness, this, this dead dirt I was trying to grow food in, it was a lot of work for what I was getting in return. Too much work. And, and then someone handed me, uh, it was a master gardener that handed me the Square Foot Gardening book by Mel Bartholomew. And that was one of the, the things that I learned that really helped me grow food in South Florida. So this is, <laughs> Sally's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Can you, yes. So this was in 2011 when we bought our house. <laughs> Sally's like, oh my gosh. Cause they saw, <laughs> they saw my place, what it looks like. Uh, this is a lot of dead dirt. Dead dirt. Can you believe that, Sally? No. No, <laughs> no I don't. Yeah. All right, after. This is what it looks like now. Wow. Wow, wow. Paradise. Yeah, we've made it our paradise. It is our paradise. Before and after. 
It was our place was the eyesore of the neighborhood. The Equality Garden Club in Wilton Manors. Uh, my friends there asked me to be on the the committee called the Green Initiative. We worked with the city of Wilton Manors and Oakland Park, where I live. They were so willing to to just go go organic in a couple of the parks. Just start with two parks in each city. And it was easier than, than I could have expected. I mean, they were just so willing to, that means in, for the public areas to eventually go pesticide free as far as using chemicals. That was just so amazing. The Sun Sentinel did this article about it. I'm also an admin for the South Florida Edible Gardening and Sustainable Living uh, Facebook page. And Cynthia Schaefer, Whatever she founded this page. Before the pandemic, we had about 3,000 members. Now it's well over 18,000 members. So you can imagine from the pandemic, when we had the food supply chain insecurities, we saw empty shelves, especially with toilet paper, but people started gardening like they did during World War II, the Victory Gardens. And so we started calling this the, the victory gardens again for the, the pandemic. So because of that, I started, well, also because I was furloughed and I had this extra time, I started Staff Servant Harvest. And the mission of my channel was to help cut that learning curve for these new gardeners. Because my first couple of years trying to grow something in this dead dirt, I mean, I tried to amend it with some cow manure and things I bought from Home Depot, but it was so much work. So I wanted to shorten that learning curve for them as much as possible. My mango tree. I'm in love with my mango tree. <laughs> my mango tree and I have a very special connection. I'm guilty of being a tree hugger. Um, okay, so what I'm grafting, I'll get to my mango tree in a little bit. So <laughs> this is another thing that probably uh, impressed Sally and how more than anything, right? <laughs> okay, eggplant being a rare fruit, how is that a rare fruit? Well, how about when it's growing on an eight foot tree? Eggplant doesn't grow eight feet tall. What are you talking about, David? All right, so the rootstock that I grafted this eggplant to is called turkey berry, Solanum torvum. When we were in Costa Rica, we were taking a hike, and I was like, oh, hello, friend. I saw the torvum, a little torvum growing. I grafted tomatoes to it also, but I've never had a tomato plant. I'm trying different varieties of tomatoes because I've never had one that really was productive but I have had eggplant do really well on this. My mango tree. So I grew this from a seedling and that's why I'm so, I feel such a strong, you know, it's just, it's different when you grow a tree from a seed and, and it grows and it produces great fruit. It's just, it's so rewarding. And I started this probably in about 2010. And I grafted Irwin to it. I only grafted part of it. I wanted to see what the, I was curious to know what the rootstock was gonna produce on its own. And they're so similar that I can't tell the difference. <laughs> so there are a couple, I'm trying to decide on whether to graft orange sherbet or lemon meringue or lemon zest. Do it all? Yeah, I might, I might do it all. Yeah, I want to. I want to do a cocktail tree. I have had people tell me because I, when I gave uh, mangoes away this past season, they said this is the sweetest mango we've had all season. So I, I heard someone mention earlier about the bricks level. I'd love to test the the bricks level on my mangoes. This is looking from the outside in, and then here's the graft. The upper left hand corner you see in, in 2014, the, what the graft looked like. I used the veneer method, veneer graft, and then 2017 when it started to really produce for us. 
Oh, so this is a quick little garden tour to just go through. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. Uh, my carambola, which I also started from a seed, by the way. This is a chiquette avocado that is producing for the first time this year. Oh my goodness, my Barbados cherry is just... Just last night, I went and picked probably 20, 20 cherries. No birds? No birds. No. We don't get any of them. No, I, birds or birds. I get, I get uh, something that's eating some of them, either birds or, or rats or something. I don't know. Yeah. Fortunately, you know, knock on wood, I don't have that issue yet. They, we, find, we find them around our pool area on the other side of the house. And then the Jamaican cherry. Oh. Also known as the strawberry tree. I don't like to call it strawberry tree because I found out there's, there's another tree that people call the strawberry tree and they get it confused. So my papaya, I have a couple episodes on my uh, channel about the, I, I named her Pur Priscilla. The, the clip that you saw of me, and she's a girl. <laughs> you grow, girl. Uh, so it's Pur Priscilla is producing papaya is over nine pounds and it's so delicious. It's the Indian, Red Indian is the name of the, that I got from Baker Creek. This is an Excalibur variety of my black sapote and it's producing for the first time. It's got blossoms and fruit on it. I hear there's a dragon fruit expert in here. <laughs> Curious. I have some other varieties and that's what this variety needs is it needs to be pollinated by another variety and I'm waiting for those others to mature enough. I'm so excited about my blue java growing pups. There's a pup, on, there's two pups there. My white pineapple. This is a uh, dwarf mulberry. I put a lot of mulch around it because I know I, anything that's on my property that is susceptible to nematodes, it's got nematodes. <laughs> and uh, so I've started a nema root, not nematode, a series on my channel because I've I was so determined to like do it, it, all my I did my research on it okay butterscotch so I just put this in the ground uh, about a month ago so I'm excited about my butterscotch uh, tapadillo from a nursery in, in Davy Jatropha nut it's an edible Jatropha nut oh Mo How'd you get in here? <laughs> Isn't she beautiful? We love our Mo. We took out one of our deck. It was a huge deck on the, the side of our house. And, and we, we, narrow, we made a, a narrow deck so that I could have more of my garden space. Because uh, on the front of the house it's, and around the pool, it's more, you saw most of it is, uh, you know, ornamental plants. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm adding banana tree, banana, banana plants here and there, and this is the the back part, the the side where we took out the deck. So you can see, that's the base of of my mulberry tree. Dead dirt. Dead dirt. That's a lot of dead dirt. dead dirt. And concrete from the pilings where the deck was. So I'm gonna need to do an episode of what I did, the before and after, and right now it's still a work in progress, but you'll see what I've done so far. That is my, uh, my blue java before I planted it. So that's what it looks like now. So I just mulched the heck out of it, and uh, I, I'd like to put at least 12 inches of, of mulch on there in places I do, in certain places. and. If I can, I will mulch 12 inches around my my fruit trees. As long as it's pulled away from the trunk, you don't want, because it heats up like crazy. You don't want to ruin the trunk. Dr. Elaine Ingham, just about everything that we know about soil science and soil biology came from, from her. She uh, she did some serious questioning at, when she uh, went, went through her studies and she's like well what about the microbes what about this and that and, the, and she was told by her professors oh they're just there 
she's like, no, but what about the forests? I mean, they have, they, they're so healthy and no one goes around, like kind of like what Cynthia Schaefer said, what does the forest do? No one's going around spraying for pests and spraying for diseases. And there's an underground network of fungi, mycorrhizal fungi, that connects these, this tree, the roots from this tree to that one. And tonight, we're just going to barely touch on, we're going to barely scratch the surface of the soil. If you want to dig deeper, check out these books, Teeming with Microbes, Teeming with Fungi. Dr. Elaine Ingham has a lot of great lectures on YouTube. If I were to pick one for you to see, it would be on the Sustainable Design Masterclass, their channel. This video is excellent. But she also has her own channel and she's got testimonials so you can get deeper into the subject. So this is from her website. You can see with biology versus no biology. There's a lot of dead dirt there to the right. And microbes matter. It makes a difference. When the biology is there, it makes a difference. Well, let me say the right biology. So we got uh, nematodes. When people hear nematodes, they, they think of the bad guys. When they think of the, the good ones, they think of what we call beneficial nematodes. The nematodes that eat the bad nematodes. Well, there are a lot of other beneficial nematodes other than those that develop a relationship with those roots, just like the mycorrhizal fungi. Symbiosis. There's a symbiotic relationship where the, the roots will actually send out a signal because there's a, a deficiency and it sends out a signal into the soil that says, I need, I need boron, I need magnesium. And the microbes, the microbe comes along and goes, I got some boron here. What, what do you got for me? I want some of your sugar. Give me some sugar. I want some of that protein you got. Protein, carbs, mostly sugar. So it's basically, it gets cookies from the plant and it gives the boron to the, to the root. There's that symbiotic relationship. And uh, that's what you want. That's what we, that's what makes a healthy soil, healthy plants, and healthy people. Composting. This is one of my favorite subjects. This is a subject that I, I spoke at the Equality Garden Club. So this is my this is my compost playground, I call it. That's Bubba Jr., Big Bubba, and Goliath. <laughs> so why composting? Compost is a great equalizer as far as pH balance. <clears throat> and uh, soil structure, moisture control, and of course it adds beneficial microbes, nutrients, minerals to the soil. And to make sure that I got minerals in that compost, I'll take azomite rock dust and I'll throw a scoop in there. You can also add sea minerals. The, I buy some from my friends at Tree Amigos and Davey. Good guys. And it's so the sodium has been extracted. There's going to be trace amounts, but it's, it's not going to hurt your plants. It's called sea crop. So what I'll do once I replant my beds for the fall and winter garden is I'll do one drench with it and then I'll do two within you know a month apart or, or so to uh, foliar sprays with this seed crop. Another way to add minerals to your compost, uh, there are three great, what we know is chop and drops, chop and drop plants. There's the uh, Moringa. These are these are pods from my Moringa tree, and... I what large drumsticks you have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very proud of my... 
uh, you know, it's when I give a garden tour and these are hanging around my garden, they're like, what the heck? <laughs> what? Well, my, my snake beans. And so I've got pods down here. Don't leave without a pod if you don't have, if you want a, a moringa tree that this is, so this is, this variety I also got from Baker Creek Rareseeds.com. This is the, what they call the dwarf, their dwarf variety. It, I keep having to chop it down because it's like, I cut one all the way down to the ground and it grew back like with a vengeance from the stump. And I decided to, I decided to let, let it come back because, hey, that's more for my compost, that's more chop and drop I can use. And then, yeah, there's a couple other things that you can use for chop and drop and, and adding to the compost, like comfrey and tithonia, the Mexican sunflower. Do you add red dreamers or worm? I mean, I went... Yeah, I have, but the, the compost heats up so much that either they, they escaped or they, they died from the heat. Yeah. I'm going to get into my worm farming, though. Lay in a, in a little bit. Okay. Uh, I forgot to. Oh. Yeah. So this this is the the bean the python bean that we we just. It's a nice crunchy snack that you can eat raw. I forgot to mention. This is not edible. When, it's, when it gets this big, it's too fibrous. Uh, so this is, this is what I, I'll let it get this big if I want the seeds from it. But I, this is young and tender, good to eat. Looks like beans are they, what color are they? They're, uh, kind of, some of them are white and some of them are like beige. You cook it just like a regular thing? I don't cook it. Don't cook I like them raw. Really? Just, yeah. I, I, I'll just, every day for work, I'll, for my work snack, mm -hmm. just put them in a Ziploc bag. And I've got one vine that is just, mm -hmm. it's going all over my, it loves to climb my moringa trees. Uh -huh. Moringa and the python vine is a great companion uh, relationship. Your compost needs carbon, oxygen, water, and nitrogen. If it's not getting the air, it will go anaerobic. And if you listen to any of Dr. Ingham's, <coughs> any of her lectures, she'll, oh, thanks. It's sparkling, but at least it's liquid. I love sparkling. She will go on and on about how it, you don't want it to go anaerobic because that's when it gets toxic. You get the, the bad guys. And here's my compost thermometer. Rio Temp is a, is a great, probably the best you can buy and it's like $27. So the green portion, that's the active, the steady or active and you want to get in, into the hot if you can. And the reason is it just breaks down quicker when you get it that hot. Now you, you wanna get 60% of the browns, the browns are the, like the dried leaves, or I used to bring home huge bags of shredded paper from work. Good question, you know what? So he, he asked the question about the ink, you want the ink from the paper. There's not enough ink in there that's gonna be a, a bad, a serious issue. And here, here's where I'm not going for organic certification, but what I am trying to do is save that from going to the landfill. And my garden has benefited a lot more from, from that shred of paper than, than any harm that that little bit of ink could have done. So sure, if I were go, going for organic certification, that might be, a deal breaker for them, I don't know. <laughs> this was my first bin in South Florida 
and I ended up reinforcing it with something like chicken wire on the sides of it. But that front screen, I, I built it so you could just lift it out. And I had two compartments there. So the, the far right, I would switch it over to just shovel it over to the other side. And I got lots of coffee grounds from Starbucks. I don't know if Starbucks is still doing that, but they've given me so much. But at some point, the one that I was going to, they didn't want to take the time to separate the trash versus whatever. When I was pulling together this presentation, I was like, oh my gosh, there's my mango tree as a seedling. Your baby? Yeah, my baby, my mango tree as a seedling. Yeah, probably 2012 or, or 2011. How long did it take for your seedling to bear fruit? 2016 is, it's the, it started, it gave us a couple of fruit, but then it, it produced some apricot sized mangoes. So I would say never judge a tree by its first year of producing fruit. My carambola, the first year it produced fruit, I had to put most of it in the compost. It tastes awful, awful. And it still is pretty bad unless it's fully ripe, once it's fallen off the tree or it's about to fall off the tree. Now I could go a lot deeper into composting, but I just, I wanna get through this part of it. You can do the, the pile, you can do the bin like you saw, or you can do the, uh, the tumblers. I like the tumblers because as a business professional and I get home and there's, I've got a thousand garden projects that I'm behind on. <laughs> I don't have a whole lot of time to do that shoveling from one compartment to the other. I like where I can just turn it. And I know Dr. Ingham, I've heard her say once that she doesn't like tumblers. But, you know, it's because you don't, if, if what do you want to do? You, you pull it out of, of the compost and you, you smell the tip of it and you want to smell if, are you, it, does it stink? If it stinks, then it's gone anaerobic. If it smells earthy or there's no bad smell to it, there's enough aeration in the, in the mix. Kiki, how'd you get in my presentation? Isn't she beautiful? She's my garden girl. So I kind of touched on Moringa. It's one of the dynamic mineral accumulators. Well, I really like my Joraform composters, my tumblers. Goliath, the big one, the name is Mantis, like praying mantis, I like that name. Who here does compost tea? Okay. The first year that I, I first discovered compost tea, I was a fanatic about it. I was, <laughs> I, was telling all my friends about it that didn't really care about gardening. <laughs> they were gonna hear about it anyway, because I just love the science of, of what you can do with, with compost tea. And that first year, I, I was putting compost tea out of my, my garden beds two or three times a month. And I, had, I didn't see any nematode damage for a long, long time. Like it really did, a, it was a huge difference. I had better success with, with that than I did buying the beneficial nematodes and because it was so expensive and I had one, enough for one application. Maybe if I had more money and could buy more and have more than one ap application it would do better but at least I feel like at least I inoculated. For those who don't know about compost tea, you need a five gallon bucket, an air pump to keep it aerated. Brew time is 24 to 48 hours. The basic ingredients, this is, this is my basic, basic recipe for about four cups of compost, kelp, warm castings, or bat guano. And then you can buy chunky compost teas. Mulch, now this is the base of my carambola. And I did put about 11 inches of mulch around this one and I, I heavily mulch it. Oh, so this is my warm farm because when we moved to our place and it was just dead dirt, you dig anywhere, you could not find an earthworm anywhere. It just wasn't happening. But when I started doing the heavy mulching, I'm talking where a truck 
comes and dumps a big load in the driveway. Hal and Sally, I, I used to get loads that would, the pile would be about this high and fill the whole driveway and spilling out into the street. Okay, so my point is, I saw a population explosion of earthworms because they love the organic matter and they're the chompers, chomping away, processing it, and adding worm castings. Now, anywhere where I have been mulching, I dig and, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to disturb you, worm. You know, I hate digging there because <laughs> I keep finding these earthworms that are, I'm disturbing. And I'm not just disturbing their, them, I'm disturbing all the life that's in that soil. So organic matter attracts earthworms. It hold, organic matter holds 10 times its weight. Oh, I spelled weight wrong. <laughs> I just caught it. <laughs> but wait, there's more. <laughs> so in water much less, you can water much less, like 50 to 70% less watering. And then spend less on fertilizers. It's great for the environment. And I was having a discussion with someone earlier. It, it's a great way to sequester carbon. There's a fantastic video on YouTube on, on how that is a powerful way to se sequester carbon. Now, this is what the mulch pile that the truck would deliver. It's very labor intensive, and so th this is why I would never do it in the, in the summer months. I would do it in the, in the cooler part of the, parts of the year. But the guy that I'm, the arborist that I'm getting my mulch from, and it's free. It's all free. I, I, try, to, I try to tip him if, if I'm there when he's you know, dumping it, but he has a smaller truck, so it's a much smaller pile, much more workable. But the reason I wear a mask when I'm doing the mulch is because if you, if you have allergies at all, you want to wear a mask because that methane gas kicks up something. I'm not sure what it is. And I'm still kind of got a residual cough from that. Um, my oregano oil helps a lot. <clears throat> Bold spores in the, uh, that are growing in the mulch. What I try to do is I'll, I'll try to do it downwind when there's a breeze and it's blowing it away from me. <laughs> but Okay, I've got other seeds. If someone can name who that man is. Dr. Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. All right. I'll tell you. This is Jeffrey Smith who asked me. Oh yeah. He he. <laughs> Jeff. Jeffrey Smith founded the Institute for Responsible Technology, and I when I was furloughed, I thought, you know what the heck? Let me just send him my my. Uh, my demo reel, some of my work, and see if he likes it. He responded with, I really like your work. <laughs> I had to pinch myself because I, he's one of those that on YouTube, I would, I would listen to his lectures while I'm gardening. I mean, I just, I wanted to know, you know, what, what the dangers are of glyphosate and why we need to ban it from the planet, you know. <laughs> and then he contacted, and I did a couple of video projects for him. But then he asked me to do this film for him, and it included Dr. Ingham's story about something that happened in 1991. Experts reported in 1991 that the world was within two weeks of a genetically engineered microbe creating a global cataclysm. I'll just give you a, a quick nutshell version of, of what happened. Regardless of what you think of GMOs in our food, okay, this. This is a completely different thing. So GMOs, they, they had a really good intention. Scientists genetically engineered bacteria to convert plant matter into alcohol. The plan was to distribute it to farmers so that they could mix it with leftover crop material to create alcohol 
which would run their tractors. It sounded like a great thing because you could now, instead of field burning, you would rake up all of those residues on your field, put it in a bucket, big bucket, on your farm, inoculate this genetically engineered microorganism that produces alcohol, and in about mm, two weeks, open the spigot at the bottom of that bucket, and out comes 34 proof alcohol. Dr. Ian was a professor at Oregon State University at the time. I had a graduate student that was interested in genetically engineered organisms. In an experiment that would ultimately be used to help him get his PhD, he mixed the sludge from the genetically engineered bacteria with soil and planted wheat seeds. My graduate student went into the laboratory of a Saturday morning and went, oh my gosh, a whole bunch of the plants are dead. All of those um, treatments where the genetically engineered bacterium had been present were dead. They were slime on the surface of the soil, just green mush. Two weeks before they were going to do a field study on this organism. By the Klebsiella planticula engineer. If that bacteria had gotten out, there's no putting it back. Don't let the gene out of the bottle. So it could have... We're not saying in the film, we wanted to leave room for the doubters. We're not saying it would have destroyed all the life on this planet. We're saying, what if, what if this was let out? And what would happen to us if all plant life, on the, all terrestrial plant life, were turned into slime? So I, anyway, I won this Telly Award for editing the film. It's only 16 minutes long. You can watch this film at protectnaturenow.com. Great. So any questions? Have you ever had um, palm tree trimmings dropped as well? Can you use those? It has it been an issue? Because I've had some people tell me it doesn't break down as fast or things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, so whenever I get a delivery of the, the mulch, there's always, he usually has some palm in there. And it's palm fronds, and it's really hard to work with, and that's why I don't prefer to use it. But when I, when I do get it, I like to feed back to the palms what I get from the, you know. So when I had my mango tree trimmed, usually I've always done the trimming myself but this time I had it professionally done, I, I wanted him to be able to shred it and keep that mulch and feed it back to my mango tree. So the mango shreds went back to the mango because those are the nutrients that mango tree took up and they will be there again. And I'm, this might sound a little weird, but I had goosebumps when I, I was wheeling it back. I'm like, okay, here, you're going back to where, where you came from and you're gonna feed the mother. <laughs> You're going to feed the tree again. It was, uh, I have this strange connection with my mango tree. Or is it so strange? <laughs> Am I the only one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm a tree hugger. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Elaine Ingham and her soil food web team have seen farmers double, triple, and even quadruple their crop yields by soil building with biology. And of course, that leads to higher profits. I'm curious if you think about feeding the soil and soil building as the same. Let me know your thoughts in a comment. Hey, if you got something out of this, please consider giving a thumbs up like on this video, subscribe to the channel, Click on that bell so that you'll be notified when I upload videos in the future. And let's grow together.